a possible storm. More now on our top stories and the federal government has released the modelling used to develop its plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Now all this comes as the UN Climate Summit in Glasgow has been extended for another day to try to secure an agreement to limit climate change. Well, for more on this, let's bring in our political panel now. We're joined by Liberal MP Trent Zimmerman and also by Labor MP Josh Wilson. Good morning to you both. It's great to see you. Good morning, Catherine Fauzia. Of course, if I was talking to Patricia Carvelis, we'd be leading with the uh, news from uh, the United States about Britney Spears as our local <laughs> fan club. Yeah, right. Are you, are you a Britney Spears fan too, Josh, or should we kick off with climate? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to climate. <laughs> All right. Well, look, um, you'd have to commend the government, wouldn't you, Josh, for releasing its modelling. Um, Scott Morrison said he would, and, he's, and he has, and it's been welcomed by some sectors of the industry. Well, I'm not sure what, what we welcome. They released the modelling. They were so, uh, they're so proud of it that they snuck it out late on a, on a Friday afternoon. Uh, it's already been described as science fiction economics. It doesn't actually put costings on what's required to get us all the way to net zero by 2050. It still has this 15% uh, of the task put down to some uh, yet to be determined magical technology. We don't need magical technology. We just need sensible policy. We're not getting that from the government. They, uh, they got dragged to net zero by 2050. They put it in a, a glossy blue pamphlet instead of a plan, what people are calling a scamplet, and now we've got the the SCO modelling or the SCO modelling to go with that. Uh, it's it's hugely disappointing, and that's why Australia's approach to to Glasgow to COP26 has been rated at the very bottom of the pile mm. by our international peers. And it's a great shame because we've got the the influence and the harmful effects of climate change happening in Australia right now, and at the same time, the opportunities. Uh, that we should be taking advantage of, that we're really, really well placed to take advantage of in terms of renewable energy and the jobs that go with that, well, they're, they're passing us by. And, uh, and unfortunately, as, as the Prime Minister goes around the country kicking off uh, his re-election campaign, uh, we know what we're going to get for the next six months. We're going to get uh, more of the, the dishonesty and the incompetence that's been the hallmarks of this government. We're going to get more slogans. We're going to get scare campaigns if they can possibly come up with them. Uh, and, and that's a terrible shame for Australia because we've got a massive challenge uh, and we need a government that's prepared to, to take that on. Uh, Trent Zimmerman, you know, Climate Council researcher Tim Baxter has called uh, the modelling, I'm going to quote here, pure spin, a document that has the singular purpose of attempting to legitimise the federal government's do-nothing approach. Is that true? Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> it's um, it's actually quite detailed modelling that the government's released yesterday to support the plan. And uh, what it demonstrates is uh, essentially what uh, what many in the world have been saying during Glasgow, that one of the chief goals has to be to reduce the cost of new technology so it becomes the natural choice for economies. And uh, that's really what uh, our plan and this modelling demonstrates is, is feasible is all about because what we want to see is to see that low emissions technology uh, become the, the choice for, for the whole economy uh, because we drive costs down and that's why we are doing so much work in areas like getting the cost of hydrogen down while we're making a priority and further reducing the cost of solar which has fallen so much over the last decade and it's that combination of technologies which we're investing in that uh, really have the chance not just to drive change in Australia but I think uh, as you see some of that, uh, that argy-bargy happening at Glasgow, what it demonstrates is, is that we need to show to other countries that, uh, that firstly, there are opportunities through low emissions technology, but secondly, you can do it in a way that doesn't uh, debilitate your own economy. And uh, that's why uh, I think that if you look at, for example, the US-China statement yesterday, there was a big focus on a lot of that technology transfer. Uh, which is going to be so important for the whole world. Trent, just on hydrogen there, the modelling assumes that hydrogen will become cost competitive and we know that's its biggest barrier to commercialisation and scale right now. There is so much unknown with that technology. If uh, it's not cost competitive, it would co price carbon in the voluntary scheme at $400 a tonne. Is it risky to seemingly put all the eggs in hydrogen's basket? Well, we're not putting all the eggs in hydrogen's basket. But in a fact, fair for whack? Example, in, well, if, 
our largest emissions are electricity and the uh, modelling shows that by 2050 we'll be almost entirely reliant on solar and wind power for our electricity generation, which is exactly where we need to be. Um, but look, I, I think the, the scale and the speed of development in hydrogen is providing a lot of confidence that we can achieve those goals. And we're seeing that investment having not just from the federal government through our hydrogen strategy, we're seeing the states like my own state of New South Wales investing heavily in it. We're seeing companies like Fortescue and Twiggy Forrester putting their money behind it as a vote of confidence. Um, you're seeing other countries around the world, particularly places like Japan and parts of Europe that are uh, really excited about the potential of hydrogen. So. I do think we can have a high degree of confidence we'll get there and we're, we're starting to see that bear fruits already. Uh, Josh Wilson, Labor has uh, the real advantage here, doesn't it? I mean, you know, the Labor Party said that they will reduce their modelling and their plans after the climate change uh, summit in Glasgow. Now that Labor has been able to see what uh, the government is offering in terms of modelling, one, when can we expect Labor's own plans to, be, to come out and to be published? And two, what will be the answer? What would Labor be offering as an alternative? Well, Fauzi, we've been very clear for a long period of time, the idea that, that people should be comparing uh, the government's plan and, and waiting for our plan is you know, 180 degrees the wrong way around. The government hasn't got any plans. I mean, they, they literally do have not announced one new policy through this last painful eight-week process where they've been dragged to net zero by 2050 with, with nothing behind it. Uh, and, and Trent talks about the technologies that we need. I mean... That, that is blindingly obvious and has been blindingly obvious for, for 10 years. OK, which so, is why so what will we're, Labor we're, then, then offer as an alternative in response? Well let's, let's start, well, let's start with where we are. Where we are now is we, we've got a series of, of Labor reforms in ARENA and the CEFC and the Renewable Energy Target that have helped us along the path uh, that, that Labor started between 2007 to 2013. So that's what's got us here and we've got a government that throughout the last year eight years has has tried to abolish those institutions of energy transformation at, at every turn they haven't got any new policy now we have already said net zero by 2050 we've said that we'll legislate net zero by 2050 we've committed 20 billion dollars to rewiring australia because all of the energy experts that come and talk to trent and i on the energy uh, and environment committee say that the the most important thing to do right now is to upgrade our energy uh, transmission grid so that we can get more renewables uh, into our system and to share them around between the jurisdictions more efficiently. So we've already announced a policy on that. We've already announced a serious policy when it comes to electric vehicles because Australia has made zero progress towards the electrification of our transport system and towards reduction of emissions in our transport system, which is critical. And it's not just critical for emissions reduction, it's critical for reducing uh, uh, harmful vehicle emissions that uh, impact on human health and are leading us towards being a dumping ground for some of the worst uh, quality vehicles in the world. And it makes us, it makes us insecure when it comes to uh, liquid fuel. We are one of the most dependent countries in the world when it comes to liquid fuel. And all of the rest of the uh, developed nations are moving to electrify their transport systems for the climate benefits, for the job benefits, mm. but also to give themselves greater energy self-sufficiency, which has been completely ignored by this government. Well, so, so, any so, so I might just get, uh, give Trent a chance here. Trent, can you um, uh, outline some details, some policy detail, particularly with respect to who is going to fund the technologies in this modelling? Yeah, so look, there's a couple of things. Firstly, we see the role of the federal government to be a real catalyst for this technological investment, and uh, that's why the technology roadmap envisages and commits to over $20 billion uh, of funding over the course of this decade to support those technologies and we've identified where the priorities are so everything from that ultra cost uh, low cost solar through to hydrogen through to green steel and aluminium soil carbon etc uh, and that is serving uh, as a real catalyst for more private sector investment and it will be a partnership between uh, the private sector and government and really the role of government uh, has been through bodies like the CEFC, which I strongly support and have been strongly supported by both the Turnbull and Morrison governments as a vehicle for, for driving change, uh, as, as filling a gap where the markets are not willing to invest. And when the market takes over, then uh, we start to look for new areas of technology that it can develop. So, for example, this week, 
we saw the commitment for effectively a, a, a $1 billion half, half government commitment, half private sector commitment, uh, $1 billion fund to support uh, the commercialisation of, of new technologies. And that covers everything from efforts to try and reduce the impact of uh, or reduce emissions from livestock uh, through to through to better, better battery design. So uh, these are the type of roles that government can play a strong role uh, in supporting us as we head towards that near, net zero target. Josh Wilson, do you agree that it will be the private sector that needs to lead the way and the government will then back them up? Is that the right way? Well, that's that's already been happening because mm. because it's obvious that the transformation need, needs to occur. It's a, it's a uh, it's happening worldwide. It's being felt in the market. It's being expressed through investment and uh, companies in Australia and elsewhere are, are basing their future uh, and their their plans on that reality. It's actually the Morrison government that hasn't woken up to that yet. Labor's been saying that for the better part of a decade. So there's no argument about about markets and, and investment and entrepreneurship playing a role, but what they are crying out for is, is government policy, any government policy. I mean, the $20 billion that Trent refers to is all existing spending, all existing programs mm. based on the government's existing inadequate uh, emissions reduction target, which doesn't have any science behind it, still doesn't have a national energy plan behind it after eight years and several... Uh, uh, energy ministers. I mean, it's that what I find really hilarious at the moment is that in the the prime minister's quest for a scare campaign, his latest thing is to go around saying that he's not going to make Australians do something. I mean, as if anyone is, but he's certainly not going to be making Australians do something. What Australians want, what Australians want, is for him to do something. They want their government to do its job. They want their government to be the stewards uh, of our social and economic well-being and lead us through a transition that's occurring. Uh, but we're not, we're not seeing that from, from this government. And they've spent eight years uh, mucking around when it comes to the biggest uh, economic and environmental challenge that faces the globe. And well, I can tell you one thing for free, we, we will not muck around. Final, final word from uh, Trent on those points and something that actually Josh brought up a little bit earlier about trust. We heard a lot about trust and the Prime Minister yesterday. Uh, Anthony Albanese was going hard on the issue. Malcolm Turnbull has also come out. Uh, does he have an issue with trust with vote voters? Well, I, I, look, politics is a highly divisive and competitive uh, mm. field of endeavour <laughs> from my experience. So, um, But what I do know is that obviously uh, the Australian people put their trust in him at the last election. Uh, and if you look at Australia's performance over what has been the most difficult period in the history of most of us, most of our lifetimes, uh, that trust has been honoured through the fact that uh, we've actually lived through this awful pandemic and have basically survived that pandemic as, as firstly one of the countries that's done best in making sure that our population hasn't been infected with the virus. But secondly, if you look at all the indicators, uh, you're seeing um, the fact that uh, our economy has fared better and will recover better than virtually any other part of the world. All right. We are going to have to leave that discussion there. We thank you both for, for joining us this morning, Trent Zimmerman and uh, Josh Wilson. But, uh, Trent, you definitely want to stay tuned for this next story. We've just got some breaking news coming out here. Uh, a Los Angeles judge has terminated the conservatorship that controlled pop star Britney Spears' life uh, and finances since 2008. Well, there you go. Yep. Uh, she's finally free. Yeah, she's free. She's free. She's free. That's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Josh is... Josh I think we should have a call to do the next interview with as many Britney Spears lines as possible. Yeah. <laughs> like, oops, she did it again. Thanks, gentlemen. Yeah. See you later. Thank you. Maybe one more time. <laughs>